little bit different tonight in the way the handout works. Um, no real fill in the blanks as usual. I'm not smart enough to uh, put a PowerPoint together. And so uh, as we move through the study tonight, there are just some, some questions and plenty of room to answer. You will, um, you will find most of these answers as you listen closely. In fact, as we begin tonight, we begin with uh, talking about Hezekiah just a little bit, and that was uh, the previous chapters of Second Chronicles in uh, 31, 32, 30, 31, and 32. And when he came to rule in Judah... This is where you will get your first answer. He was 25 years old. That is a young king. 25 years old. Seems to be pretty young to become a king of any nation, much less what is now really known and considered to be the remnant of God's people. And Hezekiah was king of Judah for 29 years. So that answers your second question. You get the idea, right? His reign could be characterized really in three parts. There, were, there was the opening of his reign, which was the revival experience. There was his faith-filled resistance to the enemy as Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came knocking and ultimately sent his spokesperson by the name of Rabshakeh to intimidate them and to just hopefully get them to say, hey, we give up. But Hezekiah's faith-filled response allowed him to remain faithful and to trust in the Lord, and I love especially what he said to the leaders that were in charge of Judah at the time. He said, he said, guys, they may have the largest army in the world right now, but there's more with us than there are with them. And so we need to always remember that, you know, we're in touch with the one who's in charge. Okay? And so Hezekiah taught us that in the second part of his king, uh, king reign or kingdom reign. And then the last part would be his restoration of health for the final 15 years of his uh, reign. Remember he got sick and uh, he was pronounced kind of a death sentence. He turned his head toward the wall, prayed, and the Lord gave him a healing and he was able to reign for 15 more years after that. So, great victories and advancements in society prevailed during the kingdom years of Hezekiah in that 29-year reign. Now, as Hezekiah's days are coming to an end, the nation of Babylon is beginning to make some noise on the world stage. While Assyria is still in power... Their days are numbered. They began the ruling, or began to be the ruling nation of the world, and did so for about 200 years. And their capital city was none other than Nineveh. And Nineveh is in modern-day Iraq, but it is one of those cities that has kind of been lost and it's only been in recent years that there's been any archaeological digs to find the truth about Nineveh. But everything that's been found is biblically correct, especially if you go into the book of Jonah, where he said it was a three days journey to walk across it. And that's what they found. This city was huge. And so Assyria, with that being the capital city, was also known as being very large, very intimidating. However, interestingly enough, on the world history stage, when, when Babylon came in and overran Assyria, you never hear about them again. I mean, I guess when you're going to beat somebody, beat them bad, because that's exactly what happened. 
and uh, they really just fell off the map completely. Ultimately, of course, Babylon leading the charge to destroy this great capital city known as Nineveh. So, who's the world power now with uh, Hezekiah turning the reins over to his son Manasseh? It would be Assyria. And who is the world power coming in the future? That would be Babylon. So, as Hezekiah passes off the scene in 686 B.C., we are heading quickly into the time of ultimate Babylonian rule. Uh, By the way, it was in 612 B.C., that uh, the alliance of nations led by Babylon overcame the Assyrian Empire. All interesting stuff, especially as we get toward biblically thinking about how important Babylon was to even modern day history because of the writing of the book of Daniel during that time and then ultimately into the times of the Medes and the Persians. So Judah was already uh, preparing their next king, Manasseh. If you put the dates together, and we've done this a few times throughout our, our course of this study, if you put the dates together, the dates of Manasseh's reign and the dates of Hezekiah's reign overlap for a few years. Uh, it is because that he was being groomed to be the next king, even though he was um, quite young, because he began his training, the Bible tells us, at the ripe old age of 12. That's right, fresh out of Little League, Manasseh, according to chapter 33, verse 1, he was 12 years old when he began to reign, or had the you're the next king in line title again hezekiah is still alive but manasseh is being groomed to be the next king you thought 25 was young boy we're really going backwards wait till we get to josiah in a couple of kings as we wrap up this study But his training, Manasseh's training, began in the final 9 to 10 years of Hezekiah's reign, and that would have been between 695 and 686 B.C. It was during these years he witnessed his dad fall away from God, then repent, and then he did a very foolish thing in opening up the temple to the Babylonians. Why is that foolish? Because... Babylon's going to be the ones that come on in. In fact, they're around 100 years away now from when Babylon came in and overran Judah, taking uh, the temple down, destroying Jerusalem. It's when they began to carry away the captives. That's where Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael become kind of at the forefront. Just horrific things happen, and it if, if, if I'm going to use the Bible as a, as a book of literature alone, which I don't, but if I was, I would say that what Hezekiah does here in chapter 32, we're going to look at it here in verses 24 through 29. Um, if we look at it, these verses are a type of foreshadowing for what is ultimately coming with the Babylonians. Chapter 32, verse 24, the Bible says, In those days Hezekiah was sick unto death. He prayed to the Lord and spake unto him, and he gave him a sign. Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done for him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. So even after he was sick, he didn't really come back to the Lord and and thank the Lord so much. Notwithstanding, verse 26 says, Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord came not upon them in the days of Hezekiah. 
So again, we see that there was a, a fall away, a repentance, and then if you flip over very quickly to 2 Kings chapter 20, 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 12 and following, we find what he does with the Babylonians. At that time, this is now late in the reign of the king, likely Manasseh is being groomed to be the next king as a young boy, literally a teenager, very impressionable at this time, obviously. At that time, um, shall we give this name a shot? Baradak Baladan and the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters to the, uh, and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. Hezekiah hearkened unto them and showed them. He opened up the house of his precious things, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious ointment, and all the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasuries. There was nothing in the house nor in his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. So get this. The richest nations of the day, when they opened themselves up, more powerful nations were going to seek after those riches of the weaker nations. And so Judah, not being a very large nation, opened themselves up with Hezekiah leading this to some Babylonians who are stirring themselves up to ultimately want to be world rulers. And of course, we know Nebuchadnezzar would come in and he would rule the world for a piece. And so, and so this is just kind of a foreshadowing of really an awful side of what Hezekiah did for the nation. Verse 14 says, Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said unto him, what said these men, and from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, hey, they're from a far country, even from Babylon. He said, what have they seen in, the ho in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, all the things that are in mine house have they seen. There's nothing among my treasures that I've not showed them. And Isaiah said to he or rather, yeah, and Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried away to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. So this was a huge overstep, maybe. Maybe Hezekiah should have been just a little bit more discreet. Whatever the situation was, he certainly put them in harm's way for the future. And... By the time he, um, Hezekiah passed away, Manasseh would have been around 21 to 22 years old. So we might imagine that the actions of Mana uh, rather Hezekiah's later years would have rubbed off on his son Manasseh. And we can say that the thing that impressed him most about his dad was his earthly fortune and his earthly prominence. So, the key ages for Manasseh are, of course, 12, when he began to be groomed to be king, and then 21 or 22, when he actually became the king of Judah. So the earthly, or this earthly vision that Manasseh feeds off of, which he saw through his dad, Hezekiah, is going to lead us to a not-again time during his 55-year reign, 45 of this on his own, as king of Judah. This is pretty amazing. So the Bible says in chapter 33, verse 1 of 2 Chronicles, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, 
and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. But did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord like unto the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. It's horrible to say, but we've got to keep reading. He built again the high places, which Hezekiah, his father, had broken down. He reared up altars for Balaam, made groves and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. He also built altars in the house of the Lord, whereof the Lord said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. He built altars for all the hosts of heaven. In the two courts of the house of the Lord, he caused the children, his children, to pass through the fire in the valley of Hinnom. Here we go again with child sacrifice. Also, he observed times and used enchantments, witchcraft, dealt with familiar spirits and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He even set a carved image, the idol which he had made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Neither will I any more remove the foot of Israel from out of the land which I have anointed for your fathers, so that they will take heed to do all that I have commanded them according to the whole law, to the statutes and ordinances of the, by the hand of Moses. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. This was when they came in and conquered under Joshua. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the hosts of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him off to Babylon. So first of all, we can just basically describe his reign in two parts. First of all, he just absolutely fell off the deep end. Manasseh fell off the deep end. And how many times have we seen it? A child that comes from a family of wealth and fame flies off the handle. You can't handle the, way, the wealth, the fame, the fortune, whatever it comes to. Uh, I mean, even in our towns, I, I remember growing up with kids who had families with substantial enough wealth to pretty much give their kids anything. And it always happens this way. That kid gets the brand new Trans Am when they turn 16. When they turn 16 in a month, the Trans Am is in the wrecking yard because... I don't really care for it. However, you can watch the kids that, you know, worked at the grocery store stocking shelves or whatever, and they bought their own pickup, and, you know, that pickup might be, you know, I was a child of the 80s, it might have been a mid-70s model Chevy, but, boy, it's immaculate, it's clean, and it's cared for. Why? Because they've worked for it, they've earned it, they've, they've done what it took to, uh, to make this right and to do it the right way. So we've seen this kind of activity before and Manasseh unfortunately saw Hezekiah his dad go through a time of great illness great restoration a time where he said all this goodness has gone to my head and he's seen all these riches come through and ultimately Hezekiah got his heart right with God but Manasseh learned the bad stuff and that's where he went immediately after becoming king of Judah. In fact, I dare say that Manasseh exceeded even the previous king, Hezekiah's dad. What was his name? Amon, right? Or Amon. Oh, no, Ahaz. I'm sorry. Ahaz was, was his dad. And Ahaz went off the rails, but goodness, not like manasseh is doing manasseh had been groomed under amazing privilege 
And with Hezekiah's wavering back and forth, Manasseh chose to follow the back and not the forth, unfortunately. Remember, again, he was in his early 20s when his dad passed the nation to him, and this certainly afforded him some free reign. And his freedom led him down some dreadful paths to the point where I, I have a hard time even reading some of the things that he did. The child sacrifice, awful. The verse 6, I mean, he's observing the times. Uh, that means astrology type situations are going on, which leads right into enchantments, witchcraft, familiar spirits. That would be like having a seance. I don't know if you guys know that that's what we're talking about here. And with wizards, by the way, where do I stand on that? Those things are real, man. It's real stuff. The devil wants to use anything and everything to try to get our focus off of God and onto anything in the mysterious realm. How do I know that? Because I have to confess to you, it's something that's always allured me now i'm not proud of that but i'll tell you when it started it started when i was a little kid my great-grandmother my nana who i love and adore didn't come to know the lord until she was in her 80s and i spent a lot of time with my nana she was pretty much the only one that could tame me when i was a little kid and she when i was a little kid took my hand and did some palm reading in my hand. And she showed me a couple of things on my hand that I'll never forget. They just got in my mind. And it made me curious. And I'll just say this, I've always been a pretty spiritually sensitive person. Sometimes when you're spiritually sensitive, the devil can play on that as well. And so when the kind of mysterious things start entering into my mind i get like a little bit okay you know i used to read my my uh, uh astrology thing every every day and now i didn't go by it or anything like that but i read it because i was curious guys that's something not to be messed with and i know this about me now and boy i stay far and away from that sort of junk because that's what it is and the devil looks for any little peephole to get in and if if manasseh was any kind of spiritual sensitive at all then he fell by the wayside of the devil's doings the enchantments the familiar spirits all of these curious mysterious things which he leads he remember is the he's he's darkness and not light and so Again, this is certainly a dreadful path. And so, with that, he also had the means, the money, the prosperity, because he was the king and because his dad left him a fortune, literally, to deal with. And it leads me to ask myself, how do I view prosperity? And on your handout, why does prosperity lead us so many times into great temptation i believe it's pretty simple when you look at manasseh we get our eyes off the lord and just on the stuff and we get more consumed with the stuff than we get consumed with the lord and you can write down your own version of that but it is certainly something that comes to mind I also have to ask myself, left in charge of my own life and decisions, how do I choose to live? Because basically we're all kind of on our own, you know, we have husbands and wives to answer to a little bit and stuff like that, but, but basically we, we pretty much choose to do what we want to do, so what do i choose 
how do I live? Does my life honor and glorify the Lord in all things? Or am I wasting the Lord's goodness on, on and in all things worldly, like Manasseh was? With verse 10 in mind, verse 10 says, The Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. How do you think he spoke? Probably through a prophet, right? That's the Old Testament manner in which the Lord would speak to his people is through a prophet. So imagine the preacher standing in front of us and speaking about things that are needing attention in our lives and we just don't do anything about it what do you think the lord's reaction to that is going to be verse 11 wherefore the lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the kings of assyria which took manasseh under the thorns among the thorns rather and bound him with fetters and captured him and took him to Babylon it's likely he got a tour of Nineveh just not really the tour he wanted so how do I respond then with verse verses 10 and 11 in mind how do I respond to God's word and godly preaching godly teaching and or godly counsel this has to be on the forefront of our minds when we read these 11 verses. The last question on the front page here is, what should our response, or what should be our response to the wherefore? The wherefore is there because it has to be brought about by what the previous actions were. So, we need to know that God is paying attention. He is paying attention to our lives. The second thing about Manasseh is that he fell on his face in repentance. I'm so thankful for this. Verse 12, when he was in affliction, but why was he in affliction? Can we say these were self-inflicted wounds? possibly pretty pretty confidently when he was in affliction he besought the lord his god humbled himself greatly before the god of his fathers prayed unto him and god was entreated of him or god heard him heard his supplication brought him again to jerusalem into his kingdom then manasseh knew that the lord he was god so at least Manasseh got right with God. I mean, that's at least a positive here. I am thankful for that. It reminds me of Hebrews 10.31, which tells us it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the Lord. And that's certainly true, and I think Manasseh would tell us that. Those months, we don't even know how long he was in captivity. However long it was, a week, a month, a year, two years, I mean, he reigned for 55, so it could have been a decade that he was gone. They got his attention. I wonder sometimes what it takes to get our attention. You know, God puts his word here to get our attention. And hopefully we can relate and apply his word to our lives so that we go, huh, I don't want to make the same mistakes Manasseh made. I think I'm going to follow the good example of Hezekiah, not the poor example. So the wherefore in verse 11 should reach up and grab us around the neck. In response to Manasseh's godless ways, the living God got a hold of him. Ultimately, Manasseh paid attention. You see, when we stray away from God, His ways, and His path for us, we're going to always be he heading down the road of consequence. And I fear today too many Christians are on 
this road. This road called consequence. When we think to take control of what we think is my life, we're going to quickly remember as believers in Jesus Christ, the scripture is true. I go back to Second Corinthians, or rather, First Corinthians, very quickly. If you want to turn there, and we're almost done. First Corinthians chapter six, verse 19. First Corinthians chapter six, verse 19. Just about the time we think it's my life. I remember this verse. Paul says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is God's. Chapter 7, verse 23, he reiterates by saying, Ye are bought with a price be not ye the servants of men in this whole scene there is the unfortunate consequence of verse 17 in second chronicles 33 after Manasseh got his life right, got the city built back up, the temple back in place. The Bible says, nevertheless, the people did sacrifice still in high places. So he never really got the people back. This reminds me of the great words for one of my favorite movies of all time. Julius Campbell says to Gary Bertier, You're supposed to be the cap captain of this team? To which Bertier says, Yes, I am. Julius Campbell says, Then attitude reflects leadership, captain. Remember the Titans. We easily see the mistakes, the flaws, the errors here. The question is, how do we apply them? How do we apply what we learn from Manasseh? Let's pray. Lord, help us to do just that. Help us to apply what we see and what your gracious spirit shows us in opening up your scriptures to us. Thank you for your word, and I pray that we would quickly apply it exactly where we need to. In Jesus' name, amen. Didn't get to fill in all those blanks, so you can do the rest on your own.